This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Into my uh, radio and uh, poof, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting. That's it. That's it. So, so just a radio and a TNC and there you go. And a laptop. Yeah. Yep. And so what do each of those components do? Okay, so of course, you know, the, um, the, um, the, the, any computer that has either the serial port or now the USB with the, the newer models, you know, that's how your interface is. So you uh, have your laptop or comp your personal computer, or you know, you can even do a lap or whatever. You um, install a client. In this case, uh, Airmail is what we use, but there's other ones out there. Uh, you connect your TNC, which is your modem, which goes from uh, digital signals from your computer to analog, because analog is all radio. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it converts digital signals to analog, which then broadcasts over a frequency to some other destination. And so your uh, your TNC is really just keying the mic. It's like doing the, right. the push to talk or whatever it is. And it uh, kind of doesn't even know what's on the other end, does it? I, I, exactly. It's, it's, um, it's using the AX25 protocol, breaking things into packets, hence packet radio. Mm -hmm. And it's broadcasting a series, the, the data into a series of packets to a receiving station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what gear have you liked? What, what do you use that that's been working for you? Um, so I like uh, Yesu. There, there's a couple of ones out there. There's Icom, very famous. Yesu. Um, Kenwood makes good radios. Um, Cantronics makes the, the terminal node connector, or TNC. And there's a couple of other ones. Uh, and now they've got small ones now, which are just basically, it looks like a, just a square box with uh, USB ports on it. And you plug it in. Yeah, like, like the XTNC. Exactly. Yeah, XTNC. Um, so those are very cool. And the radios have come down in price now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ham radios used to be these big bulky things that grandpa used to have that weighed, you know, 25, 30 pounds. And now, now they look like walkie talkies. You know, uh, a friend of mine at work brought in uh, a, a it was a Chinese manufacturer I had never heard of. Um, now they're making them for sixty bucks. You can buy a ham radio for sixty bucks, and mine was three hundred three years ago. So, um, but I like uh, Yesu mm -hmm. and uh, and Icom and Cantronics for TNCs. Cool. Well, I, I hope that's enough where, you know, some of the uh, the hackers in the audience that are like interested in this kind of stuff kind of know, like once you like, you know, t dip your toe in and kind of like know what the landscape looks like, it, it becomes a lot more approachable. And um, I know that, you know, ham radio groups uh, get older and older and they need more young blood getting in there to keep the thing alive. I mean, it's going on, been going on for a hundred years. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can see it continue to go on for another hundred years and uh, hopefully continue to um, to evolve as technology evolves. Hopefully those licenses and everything else can evolve with it. Totally agree with you. Um, the average age of a, of a uh, uh, amateur radio operator is 55 to 60 now. Um, and uh, there has been a decrease in this because of cellular technology, Wi-Fi technology, the cool stuff as we know. Um, I'm hoping that there's going to be a renaissance where younger people will get in and maybe change some of these laws, you know, kind of update them saying, you know, maybe it won't be so bad to do a little bit of encryption, a little bit of security uh, with the FCC. Um, but it takes some effort, takes some time, takes legislation, you know, as we know. Um, the tools that are mostly written for um, amateur radio are a Windows-based tool or a Windows-based application. Well, because the generation the generation that was working with it were familiar with Windows. Uh, Linux, you know, last 15 years has been up and coming. So the older generation, when they were writing Airmail and uh, RMS Express and all these other ones, they were written on a Windows platform because Linux wasn't mainstream like it is today. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have the experience. So I'm hoping that people will be able to pick that back up, refresh it, create a more efficient Linux-based email uh, client and and use some of the more modern technology to give it another uh, resurgence and kind of a you know a shot in the arm as it were. Yeah, yeah. build some in, some Linux based embedded hardware to do like digipeaters or repeaters and things of that nature. Absolutely, you know, or come up with some some kind of a even smaller lighter box. You know, uh, I do understand now that the TNCs are starting to be built in the radios now. So having a third party or a middle party box are starting to go away. So if we could have some kind of a, a Linux based airmail uh, type system uh, with a TNC built in and just you have could, one cable, yeah. 
it would be more efficient and probably be a lot more, uh, you know, faster broadcasting. You could technically do a TNC in software just using a sound card. I mean, all we're doing is, you know, using a little bit of computing power to convert some digital stuff into some tones. I mean, the same bell tones we grew up with on dial up are what's rocking 1200 baud. That's very true. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are using sound cards to emulate a TNC. Um, the quality from my understanding is not as good as a real TNC. Um, there may be packets drops or, or, or there may be some kind of interference, but I, yes, there, you can use a sound card and whatnot. So things are starting to get, uh, more refined and more streamlined, but we definitely need, need people to, to refresh these uh, client tools and, and go into new technology. Well, I mean, I can totally see a renaissance happening. Just looking at the landscape of what's happened with uh, radio and hackers, uh, you know, starting out with Wi Fi, and now suddenly it's like, ooh, we have the, you know, like the Uber Tooth is an example where, like, ooh, now we have the ability to start monitoring and auditing uh, Bluetooth, and then now that's a thing. And the same thing is happening with, um, with uh, 802.4. 5.4, I want to say, 15.4, uh, Zigbee. And so, but those are, of course, all on the ISM, but uh, it would be really cool to see some more uh, UHF, VHF, HF hacking. Exactly, especially where we can do long haul broadcasting, right? Because right now we're limited to Wi Fi. WiMAX is, you know, metropolitan area, you know, communications. Um, but if we can integrate the newer technology with the newer um, operating systems with Linux and whatnot, we will have those capabilities where we can actually broadcast farther with newer thoughts and yeah. newer concepts. And, you know, it doesn't even matter that it's like 300 baud. It could be it because it doesn't take a whole lot of. Uh, you know, data to actually, you know, make change in this world. I mean, if you look at Egypt, when they turned the internet off, the most powerful tool that they had only broadcasted 140 characters. I'm talking about Twitter here. And so that's, that's, right. that's an example of a very low bandwidth thing that could uh, be useful for making change and actually, um, you know, be nice to have something that's not within the kind of state and corporate control that is the internet. Absolutely, and that was a great example. And, uh, and now, of course, yeah, you don't have to know Morse code. Uh, to take the exams, they the FCC deemed back in 2006 that that Morse code was obsolete um, because text messaging is available um, and email is available, so it was, it was taken out of the testing. So people used to get afraid of, of testing on Morse code, the dots and dashes and all that. Well, anyway, it's been eliminated, so you don't need to know that stuff anymore. So thank goodness for that. <laughs> nice. I will. It has been an absolute pleasure, pleasure, Rob. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Darren. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You guys know how I feel about domain names. They are essential for showcasing your portfolio, your blog, your business. I remember my first website. I was at my ISP's domain and then I was like slash tilde my username, yet nobody's gonna remember that. But what they are gonna remember is a .com. It's the best, it's so globally understood, it's immediately lending credibility and the best part about .coms is that they're totally affordable at domain.com. And the whole Hack5 crew, we use domain.com because they're the best, they're easy to use, they're reliable, they don't gouge you or annoy you with irrelevant upsells, plus you can't go wrong with a company that has like a human approach to business. Just seriously, tweet at domain.com and see their customer support is a breath of fresh air. So get this, domain.com, they are huge fans of Hack5 and they wanna hook you guys up. They got a great offer, 15% off their already affordable domain names and web hosting if you use the coupon code HACK5 at checkout. That's 15% and big savings at domain.com. So don't forget to use the coupon code HAK5. When you think domain names, think domain.com. So Jeff, are you uh, happy to see me or is your, uh, your belt there blinking? Uh, I think there's some blinking lights going on. I was told DOS Blinken was cool for Tor Camp, so oh, okay. DOS Blinken. I, I didn't realize it was neutered. I, I thought it was the masculine Dare Blinken or, or maybe the feminine D Blinken. But yeah, yeah, no, I get it. I well, get it. This is actually a cutoff strip, so DOS Blinken <laughs> probably is correct. <laughs> it's totally a neutered DOS thing. <laughs> and to our German audience, es tut mir leid. Wie auch immer. Wow. Okay. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, first of all, what is this? Um, this is my um, tie for a proper business attire. Um, yeah, you walk into the board meeting and yeah, you want to look your best. You come in, you're talking to your boss and you're trying to get that pay raise. Uh, you want to look appropriate. 
and you're not quite sure what the lighting's gonna look like in the room, so being able to change the color of your tie, or possibly distract them, to get them a little bit off their feet and uh, get the power position, yeah. it's a good thing. I like that, because it's programmable, right? Yeah, it's programmable. There's an Arduino hidden in a um, Altoids type, uh, actually, Penguin Men's Tin, uh, caffeinated yeah, for your so. pleasure. Yeah. Uh, and just some uh, LED strips, there's a battery hidden, but uh, that So, so that you happens. could potentially program it to just like, basically beacon towards your wang. You could, um, do that there's been some suggestions of adding arrows that would light up as it goes to uh, like a localizer on your yes, uh, on your uh, approach vector yes um almost like a um metal detector or uh guidance system and possibly a smiley face at the end guidance for, system is good uh smiley face for everybody to uh, have a happy day uh you know or ending or ending um if you want to pay for it <laughs> Okay, so talking about paying for it, uh, you say these are LED strips. What do these run? Um, these are uh, available in lots of different vendors. Uh, the more you buy, the cheaper they get. If you buy from China, they're really cheap, but you have some fun with that. Uh, your common hacker vendors, Adafruit, uh, Maker Store, or Maker Shed, and um, SparkFun all have them. Probably uh, looking at $35 a meter and uh, it's fun, addressable, there's libraries, so it is easy enough for somebody who can't code to make some flashy lights. So tell me, what is the unique thing about these LEDs? Um, unique about them? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, these are surface mount uh, RGB LEDs that so, can change to multiple colors, so but you've got this flexible thing in a polyurethane case. So, they're semi-waterproof. Uh, water resistant is probably what the marketing people or lawyers would want to say. Uh, they have a LPD 8806 between each two LEDs. They're actually severable, so you can cut it in chunks of as short as two LEDs and make whatever pattern you want, whatever length. Um, they're individually addressable, so you can have them become a pixel display. A is matrix. there like a max? You say it's in individually addressable. If I get like a thousand of these on like a huge run, can I, you know, see from zero to 999? Uh, that is theoretically possible. You're going to have some problems with voltage. Uh, probably have to gonna add some uh, amps to the power and possibly enough to burn out your uh, Arduino. So it's what, what's the longest bit. you've ever seen? Um, I was playing with a five meter strip, which is a hundred and well, five times 32, and I'm going to embarrass myself with some bad math right now and say 160. It's in the lower third. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I've also seen 25-meter strips tied together, or 25, 25, or five five-meter strips together in a 25-meter strip. So uh, it is possible to go long. Uh, it just is a little bit slow. The refresh makes it look a little weird because it is so long. Uh, but in a coil, you do get some interesting effects because you can actually change the color in a pinwheel and have it pinwheel color so it looks like pie slice is going through the coil uh, and do some interesting effects on a side bias rather than just straight up and down. Well, what about the PCB? I mean, this thing is obviously flexible. How's that working out? Um, it's pretty flexible. I can fold it in half. Uh, and not have too much trouble as long as I don't fold it on a resistor or chip or LED. Um, it's flexible, it's just like a ribbon cable inside your laptop uh, or other small electronic device. Um, it's cuttable with a pair of scissors and uh, yeah, it's a pretty slick little product. Uh, yeah, I have to say, it's, it's really a, cloud, uh, a crowd pleaser here. Um, what kind of installations have you guys done? Uh, what's the big projects for um, these? So uh, we've put together a one inch, one pixel per inch, 12 by 12 display. Uh, and uh, we're looking at a possibility of a four foot by eight foot display with a one pixel per inch uh, display um, using, right now we're using a space diffuser plate and we're looking to actually go to a ping pong ball <laughs> diffuser uh, to add some interesting effects. I'll grab one here. Uh, and I'm not sure what the camera picks up, but it sh um, does add a little bit of diffusion, which gives you a better um, blurring and fade on the pixel. Which it's, it's it, working for the PS3, so yeah, it makes it look like an actual um, display rather than discrete LEDs, and it's much easier on the eyes. Now, um, 
you said uh, individually addressable. Uh, how do you program this thing? Um, this is programmed through an SPI protocol. Uh, it's very simple. You basically tell the program how many LEDs you have, and then you tell it what you want it to do, and it makes that happen versus across the strip of LEDs. So there's a bunch of like pre-programmed libraries for there, these, these there different are. patterns that you're doing yeah. right now and randomizing? Yeah, these uh, patterns are just pre-programmed functions. There's libraries for SPI, library for the LPD 8806. They're pre-packaged free on the internet, just like most of the Arduino stuff, and it provides a really easy way to get interactive lights. Uh, this is just uh, a little bit of mix on some of the example program to show off kind of what the strip can do. Uh, we're here trying to uh, get rid of some of our stockpile so we can get some uh, newer, possibly custom made stuff. And uh, we're looking at that to do some interesting pixel display. Okay, tell me about pixel display. Like, what's your pipe dream? You know, money's no object. What do you want to do with these guys? Um, we want to make a four foot, or four foot by eight foot is our next goal. Um, we're actually looking for a wall that has a VGA plug-in and can plug whatever you want into it. Uh, we have a Connect camera that we're using to um, get some interesting video input and then display it on our one by one or one foot by one foot pixel display. We've got a webcam tied across the street so it takes a three foot square on the uh, sidewalk and replicates that in the one foot display and uh, it creates a very interesting uh, picture and the display is actually pointed out the window so if you stand in the painted square on the sidewalk and look at our uh, window you see a representation of yourself. Oh wow this sounds like a fantastic art installation where can we see this? Uh, this is a, uh, an art installation that we're working on in downtown Olympia Washington uh, in our Oli Mega hacker space and um, we're working on a couple more of these uh, interactive display installations. We have a uh, local coffee shop who has asked for an art display to kind of attract attention. There's a coffee shop around the corner with a very similar name and they're not too happy about that. So uh, they're trying to make it memorable so that people don't forget what coffee shop it was that they were in. Uh, and a bright lighted sign will make it much easier to uh, call attention to themselves than changing their name. Yeah, I can imagine once you get this thing custom and you get that actually one by one pixel density, yeah. uh, you can really do some cool stuff. And especially if you get some way to do like a VGA driver, where it's agnostic of the programming, it's just like whatever the OS is outputting to it, then it's like all sorts of fun is on, right? Yeah. Um, actually, here at TorCamp, I uh, ran into somebody who used um, a FPGA to drive these rather than Arduino uh, to get much quicker refresh, much better resolution, and uh, much longer strips of it. So the idea of using that to create a um, driver for this that could then have a VGA or other common video connector piped into it is something that we're kind of interested in. Cool. Now, where can people that say they're near Olympia, they want to get involved with the hackerspace, where can they find out about that? Um, you can go to olimega.org and uh, check that out. Uh, we have a meetup page on meetup.olimega.org that talks about all of our classes and training and um, events that we have going on. And uh, we're on 416 Washington Street in Olympia. If you're there, it's the Capitol Theater building. We're on the second story. Uh, and we're open most weeknights from roughly 6 to whenever we get tired to go to sleep uh, and uh, that's what we're doing. We're uh, in the middle of a summer series of classes teaching uh, intro to Arduino programming, robotics, and then uh, a radio program. So, Jeff, this is so fantastic. Thank you for sharing this with our community. You're welcome. Really appreciate it. Yeah.